Welcome everybody to this session. I'm Professor David Britton. I'm head of department, uh, head of the Department of English Literature and Creative Writing at Swansea University and also the Director of Internationalization for the College of Arts and Humanities. That's a mouthful. It's my great honor to welcome you all to this event, which is hosted by Swansea University's Department of English Literature and Creative Writing and our Cultural Institute. Um, this event is part of the UK Russia Creative Bridge Programme, organized by the cultural and education section of the British Embassy in Moscow, with the support of the Foreign and Commonwealth and Development Office, and it's in partnership with our good friends at the Maxim Gorky Institute of Literature and Creative Writing in Moscow. And it's very nice to be talking to uh, friends and colleagues in the UK and in Russia. Now, what we'll be doing is we'll be watching and listening to a conversation between the prize winning author, Max Porter, who is a great friend to Swansea University, and Elaine Canning, who is Swansea University's Head of Cultural Engagement and Development. Let me tell you a little about Max. He's one of Britain's most original and innovative writers. His first novel, Grief is a Thing with Feathers, won the Swan Swansea University Dylan Thomas Prize, and it's won many other awards. And it's also, by the way, Max Won My Heart and Massive Admiration. It's a wonderful book. It's been translated into 29 languages. And Max's second novel, Lanny, uh, was a Sunday Times top 10 bestseller. It was long listed for the 2019 Booker Prize and in the opinion of me, should have won. His highly anticipated third book, The Death of Francis Bacon, was published just last week. It's published by Faber. Um, and I'm not sure if it's in the shops yet, but it's just newly out. And I'm sure that Elaine and Max will talk about that a little. Uh, Elaine is director of Swansea University's Dylan Thomas Prize, one of the largest literary prizes in the world for young writers. She's written extensively on the Spanish Golden Age drama, and she's published a number of short stories. She's currently despite already having a PhD, taking another PhD in creative writing with us here at Swansea um, and is a joy to uh, have in our team. Elaine is a member of the British Council's Wales Advisory Committee and she collaborates with the Jaipur Literary Festival. And uh, I can think of no one better to engage in a conversation with Max Porter. So I'm gonna hand over to Elaine now, and uh, please remember you can uh, ask questions on the Q&A facility, and we'll try to make sure that enough time is left at the end of this session for those questions to be addressed by Max and Elaine. So Elaine, over to you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you so much for your kind words and welcome Max. As always a joy to see you. Thank you, likewise. And many congratulations on the publication of The Death of Francis Bacon. Absolutely brilliant, which we will talk about a little bit later on in the course of the session. So thank you so much again for being with us, with us today. It's always a pleasure. So Max, shall we begin at the beginning? Let's, <laughs> <laughs> how about um, we start, we start with you telling us a little bit about your experience of the book and publishing industry and your transition to one of Britain's most highly acclaimed writers at the moment. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me. Um, and thanks for your kind words, David, as well. I um, was just hearing you describe the relationship um, between the Cultural Institute and, and the university is uh, almost a working definition of everything I think we should be proud of and interested in. Uh, in our creative and professional capacities, even even the name of it, a creative bridge. What a wonderful concept. What an exciting proposition in, in a time when so many walls are being built, um, imaginary and actual walls. Um, so it's an honor to talk to you. Um, and um, you, since our relationship 
around the Dylan Thomas Prize, I've done a few things for you, with you. We've collaborated on literary projects and you know, events and educational projects, um, and it's uh, always a joy. So thank you. Um, uh, so if I if I rattle through my the last few years of my life, perhaps chronologically, to give people a sense, um, I'll try and focus only on what's pertinent. Um, I studied the history of art um, as an undergraduate. I then focused uh, for my MA on feminism and psychoanalysis as an interpretive tool, as a critical tool in the study of contemporary art, uh, particularly performance art. I wrote my master's dissertation on the work of Paul McCarthy. Um, you know, Russia has itself an incredibly, uh, probably, after America, unrivaled history of performance art. So you'll know the kind of work I'm talking about, people like um, Oleg Kunig, um, avant-garde, um, disruptive work to do with trauma and shame and national identity. I wrote my master's thesis on Paul McCarthy, who at that time was making work, still is making work about the American empire, as it were, of, of, of death and consumerism and McDonald's and Disney. Um, and the kind of scatological and sexual underbelly of the American cultural enterprise. Um, so I wrote about an extremely shocking piece of work that where he took over a bank in London in Piccadilly and had the Queen Mother, Osama Bin Laden, George W. Bush all engaged in violent sex acts with food and liquids. Um, I mean, fans of contemporary Russian performance art will recognize this, this type of work. Um, I then graduated and worked in a, um, unlike you, I didn't have the bravery to do a PhD, <laughs> let alone two. Don't know if it's brave. <laughs> okay, the foolishness. <laughs> um, That's more like it. <laughs> so I um, was working in a bookshop, in the art department of a bookshop, and then I worked for an independent bookshop in London and I opened a few new branches and I was very happy as a bookseller. And for anyone who's watching this, who has worked as a bookseller, you'll know it's an extraordinary privilege to be surrounded all the time by literature. But in the bookshop I worked in, I had this extra pleasure, which was that they arranged the shop. It's called Daunt Books in London, if you're ever visiting London. It's still a brilliant independent bookshop. They arranged the books by country so that in the country section you would have history books and travel guides and maps but also that country's literature so say i went to russia i could binge on russian history but also russian literature and translation as well as narrative non-fiction and children's books and maps uh, and so what i did in the short time uh, well six or seven years i worked in that bookshop was i more or less traveled around the entire world binging on, on a country's national literature, which had an incredible impact on me as a reader, eventual impact on me as a writer probably, and as much as I'm as influenced by Nigerian novels as I am by English novels, you know, um, my, my influences are quite global in that regard, but also politically as a writer, uh, talking about things like creative bridges, starting to recognize the ways in which different cultures influence one another, the transmission of ideas between places, how, for example, Norse mythology has such a great deal in common with the early Russian fairy tales and how that connects to the modernist project when those tales were first being translated by people that ended up being our great avant-garde poets and writers. So I did my training as a reader, I think, when I was a bookseller. And I think I also learned important lessons about um, trust and honesty uh, and the kind of consumer proposition of publishing which is to say to someone I think based on your liking of this book you may like this book and so I think it armed me with a suspicion of algorithms and the um, marketization of certain trends and practices in literature uh, and ingrained in me the, the deep love of conversation with people about literature and the role of literature in their lives, what we look for when we read, how reading can be weaponized, how literature can be weaponized um, for, for good, for evil, um, for cultural propaganda reasons, all sorts of um, epiphanies uh, occurred at that time in my life. I then went to work for an independent publisher called Granter Books in London. 
Uh, first is a commissioning editor across the two imprints. One was called Portobello and one was Granta. And Portobello focused on literature and translation, which became one of my passions as an editor and a publisher. Uh, I don't know what the statistic is in Russia, but the statistic in the UK is that the average UK reader uh, only reads 3% in translation, uh, which is a shocking statistic um, in many ways, certainly compared to other countries. Um, but it's probably most shocking in as much as, as the lingua franca, we weren't, we were very keen to export our ideas, less keen to import um, literary and cultural ideas. Uh, which if one was seeking a kind of diagnosis of a country's malaise, political malaise, one might look to these sorts of things and think, why weren't you interested in what was happening overseas? Why weren't you interested in other ideas? And why were you so keen to export your own? Um, so I love working with translated literature. I still, to this day, obsess with translation. I think that being translated is the most exciting part of being a writer. It's an honor, but it's also a, a, a sort of, um, it's a constant challenge to think using the terms of translation is to think carefully about um, the movement of ideas around the world, um, to be exacting in your thinking about language um, and nuance and the constant flow of ideas and uh, trying to be responsible handlers of, of content and ideas. Um, I was also acquiring uh, non-fiction, narrative non-fiction and essays uh, and also literary fiction. We specialised at Granta in literary fiction. So my authors included people like um, Eleanor Catton, um, who she was, the, the first book I edited was a book called The Luminaries, a huge, um, extraordinary piece of um, structural ingenuity set during the New Zealand gold rush um, and it won the Booker Prize and that was a huge success but it was a challenging book to work on editorially so I was kind of thrown in. Um, I worked with um, the first translated novel I worked on was a really stunning novel called The Vegetarian by the Korean author Han Kang which also won the International Man Booker Prize and was um, I think a hugely significant book not, not only a hugely significant Korean novel, but a hugely significant book, I think, about trauma and um, the female experience and taboo, um, both in Korean society, but also more broadly around women's bodies and um, abnormal mental states. Um, her second book, Human Acts, was about a massacre in Gwangju in Korea. And it, as a novel, it's extraordinary, but as a human rights achievement, it is quite staggering, given the history of censorship around that subject. Uh, I published books uh, on transhumanism, um, uh, feminism, three books of essays with Rebecca Solnit, the great American uh, essayist, uh, books about music, nature. Um, so these were my these were my subjects, and I loved the editorial lifestyle. Uh, I mean, it's an honour to work in a publishing house where we are focused on finding the best literature we can. We weren't seeking to have bestsellers all the time. Uh, we were lucky enough to be doing it for the literature. Um, so I love the communal collaborative enterprise of being around the table talking about ideas. And I'm a book lover, I'm a book fetishist. So right down to the physical properties of the book, the cover design, the binding, the typesetting, the fonts. Um, I think really I fell in love with books as a physical object um, when I was helping to make them. Um, and I certainly fell in love with the people. British publishing has got many flaws. It is historically, systemically uh, racist, um, uh, unequal, unjust. Um, it is as a model of, a, a, of inequality in some respects, but it is also trying. It is quite a progressive bunch of people. Um, it's a place where ideas are carefully looked at and turned around. It's also a place of joy about reading and what reading can do and love of literacy as well. I'm very committed to literacy and have been my whole professional life because I believe that if you care about readers, then if you love books, you must care about readers. And if you want to write, you must care about readers. Um, and if we don't look after the next generation of readers, then why are we, why are we writing? Um, so then in, my, in the kind of crowded brain space of being an editor and giving oneself over to other people's work, I started to feel a certain 
scratchiness and malaise in myself, uh, creative frustration perhaps. Um, so I privately and quite quietly started working on a book in the evenings about um, mourning, about grief, and particularly the experience of two young children who lose a parent and trying to find ways of writing about the sibling relationship that I felt were um, well, true, honest, uh, but also not reliant on sort of existing formulations of, of recovery um, and happiness. And uh, I also was particularly interested in how the sibling relationship could be represented. Um, and that became a book called Grief is a Thing with Feathers, my first book. Um, another thing that was particularly interesting to me at that time was um, homage and how we write about the work of those that have come before us, um, not necessarily just affectionately, how do we dismantle uh, the framework by which their work is discussed. And I was particularly interested in, in a controversial figure, the great English poet Ted Hughes, and the, how he had used the crow and how other traditions, storytelling traditions had used a crow um, as a transmitter of pain or anger um, or melancholy or uh, superstition. Um, so this was my, sh my first book. It was short. I think in retrospect, it's, um, its point is, um, as we'll probably go on to discuss Elaine, its point is a certain hybridity. It contains fairy, fairy tales and fables and essays and domestic observation, but also some sort of rich sentimental um, sort of the philosophy of um of pain um and i was told it would it, it might sell 500 copies um to my friends and acquaintances and, and they and i earned a small advance and i didn't really think much of it um i did think it was a sort of private small thing and then it unexpectedly had this um this effect on readers and, and, and I was very lucky to win these prizes and be translated into all these languages and then at that point I started writing my second novel which was as called Lanny uh, as they would said and it was uh, I suppose uh, a reckoning with how we tell stories who has the voice to tell a story particularly if one is writing about a community be it a small community i.e a family uh, a small network of human beings or human consciousnesses uh, or, or, or a village or a town or even a nation state and how we tell the history of the place and if you suppose that someone had been listening to a place for thousands of years what might they like and what might they be frightened of and how might they describe a place and how what might be the same over the course of two or three thousand years of lived experience and what might be profoundly new about the moment we're living in now i.e ecological collapse or the internet but certainly other things haven't changed a bit national pride <laughs> arrogance violence abusive relationships um the, te the tendency to cheat and lie uh the tendency towards compassion and altruism in, in, in a community wisdom pedagogy all these things so i decided to sort of build this model village uh have this mythical character who has been watching the village embedded in the community. And then I decided to have a child go missing. Um, and that uh, signaled my moving out of London with my family and deciding that I no longer could have all these voices in my head, as well as all the voices of my author's books in my head. And I would try and go it alone um, for a short time as a writer. And then when Lanny came out, I committed quite, um, passionately to a year now obviously time has gone mad for everybody in the world so a year becomes two years um of collaborations so i've been working on this small book about francis bacon i've been writing a novel but i've also been uh, i've made a short film with a friend i've collaborated on three albums with musicians i've i've got half a dozen mentors i work with at very different places on the social economic spectrum um, variety being the key to it for me. Uh, I work with different types of writers uh, on their work, both published and unpublished, um, various literacy projects. Um, literacy and social justice are intertwined. Um, and in this country, which is a very, uh, is, is the most uh, economically unequal place in Europe, as well as various other um, 
urgent things that need addressing in, in the fabric of our social landscape. Um, li literacy is key to all those things. Um, and it is the great gift of social mobilization. So I, I sort of think if I want to keep on writing, then I must keep on working um, in, in, in the reading industry as well, which is both yeah. education, but also access um, and events and spoken word and poetry and drama and theater and music. So in a way, it's about getting the novelist out of the little box of novelist and into into the way we all live our lives. Um, and, you know, I, we've done projects together in Swansea and yeah. some of the comparable things are going to become nationwide. And I, and I hope international using international partners um, to try and translate what we're doing in our communities elsewhere. Um, so that's about that's about it, Elaine. 15 minute biography. <laughs> Brilliant, Max. Thank you. There's so much I want to ask you. So much I want to talk about. Obviously, the whole the whole um, issue of literature and literacy is something which is very close to my heart as well. As you know, we've talked about this in a great great amount of detail um, on many occasions. And um, I know you've always been a, a passionate supporter of the work we do with Dylan Ed, which is the educational strand of the prize. Um, but absolutely, absolutely. In terms of literature and literacy, they they have to go hand in hand, don't they? One hundred percent. Well, the the thing I think if if you, if our friends in Russia don't know what Dylan Ed is, it, it's fundamentally taking the, the the literary community, these lovely international authors that come to Swansea and win this prize, and their publishers and their agents, and saying, what about these schools half a mile down the road? Who don't know anything about this and aren't aren't deemed you know the, the industry doesn't deem it worth their time and energy to go and see this so it's it's such a such a simple project such a simple proposition but is so profoundly life-changingly radical to the communities it, it it goes into anyway i love it so i, I will always uh -huh. always support it <laughs> that's really kind of you to say but yeah it does make such a it has such an impact on young people you know in swansea being able to meet brilliant writers like yourself so um, yeah, absolutely fantastic. But we want to focus on you today, Max. I want to talk to you a little bit more about um, your books. And I'd like to start with Grief and Lanny before we move to Francis Bacon, if I may. Um, so much I want to ask you about um, things that you've mentioned, like hybridity um, and myth and so on. So I think if we start with if we start with um, if we start with these works as hybrid forms, um, and I think it comes very across very clearly in what you were saying already about the influences you've had dealing with translation the whole background experience you had working with musicians and so on this idea of a, of a more fluid more hybrid form is very much part and parcel of of your work um, and so um before i go into um a little bit more detail about the um the actual the way these texts are being described in terms of part fable and so on i'd like to actually ask you about the characters of Crow and Dead Papa Toothwort um, from Grief is a Thing with Feathers and Lanny. Because um, one of the things about both of these books is that they are part fable and they are magical. And so I wondered if you could talk to us a little bit about um, the extent to which myth and fairy tale and folklore inform these particular works. Um, well, you know, the, the way that uh, 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 a cultural device such as Baba Yaga um, straddles the, the, the Russian folkloric consciousness and, and appears in modernism um, and in postmodernism and in the various ways we remix will be a perfect case study actually for why I used Crow and why I used Dead Papa Toothwort. The first thing is that I'm trying to recreate or borrow or reanimate some of the energy of the pre-linguistic, the oral tradition when stories were told because I believe that that was an extraordinary um, opportunity for the human spirit to, to hear, to listen, to focus, to transmit ideas between communities. Uh, and, it and, it, and it needed and, and, and relied upon a phenomenal degree of mastery in the, in the storytelling. Uh, and also uh, an acceptance that stories change and move and aren't fixed and aren't owned by anybody. They, they, are, they belong in, in, in the teller. Uh, and, and in the listener and the great gift, I believe in the gift economy. So the folklore is to me a quick access to that truth. Mm -hmm. um, both characters also, the crow and the, and the dead papa toothwort, they both um, allow me to write about human um, communities with the benefit of hindsight, to contextualize 
human behavior on an everyday level, on a domestic level. So two children needing to get into their pajamas before bed or needing some sausages for their dinner to contextualize that minute stuff in the context of nuclear war and famine and, and white supremacy and all the terrible ebbs and flows of human history or even geological deep time. So someone like Crow, and in fact, their Papa Tooth, what too, is able to come into a situation and say, this seems like a problem for you now, Brexit, or, <laughs> or the, the milk having gone off, or the, the shape of your body, or any of these things. But you must try and fly out, as literature allows you, and as, and as deep time allows you, as, as wings allow you, um, as myth allows you to fly out and see this in a context of human effort. Uh, of what matters and what doesn't matter, what, what tragedy is, what pain is, and see yourself as part of a community that predates you or a history that repeats itself again and again. Um, I guess for clarity, but also for humour. It's their blackly comic devices, I hope, in both. Yeah. Um, but also I just love the language of the folktales. I mean, I, I mentioned the Russian folktale. I was given as a teenager an anthology, the Pantheon anthology of Russian folktales in translation. And I think as a reader, the, compared to the kind of contemporary social realist novel where everybody speaks the same, and most novels sort of begin and end in the same way, and the range of action, emotional action as well as physical action, is relatively the same in all these novels. When I read these fairy tales, I thought, ah, yes, finally, we've got um, fa fa fantastic flamboyance, we've got time travel, we've got mad vanity, we've got like corruption that would burn the pants off, you know, off a contemporary novel um, and, and an incredible energy in the line, pure storytelling. Um, and as a reader, I just, I just, I wanted that energy. I find it in children's books. I yeah. very often find it in, in um, poetry books. And I thought, why can't I have that in a novel? So yeah, uh, in a way it's me being like a hungry, <laughs> <laughs> hungry child in the cake shop I want I want it all you know and I want I want the energy one of the one of my preoccupations as a writer is 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 energy both in the line but also across the whole and trying to be expansive with the work of course um, outside of what this what the realist the realist novel allows us I want magic realism if if, if necessary you know or, or yeah. any of these things and, and the exemplar for that is is myth Okay. Yeah. And and what what you do with both of these characters actually is that they can be these huge towering presences. So they're looking in on the action, but then they have these intimate moments with the various characters in, in both works. I wondered if you if you might give us a little taste of Dead Papa Toothwort from Lanny, from the beginning of Lanny. This is um this is the very beginning of Lanny. Dead Papa Toothwort wakes from his standing nap, an acre wide, and scrapes off dream dregs of bitumen glistening thick with liquid globs of litter. He lies down to hear hymns of the earth. There are none, so he hums. Then he shrinks, cuts himself a mouth with a rusted ring pull, and sucks up a wet skin of acid-rich mulch and fruity detrivals. He splits and wobbles, divides and reassembles, coughs up a plastic pot and a petrified condom, briefly pauses as a smashed fiberglass bath, stumbles and rips off the mask, feels his face and finds it made of long buried tannic acid bottles. Victorian rubbish. Tetchy Papa Toothwort should never sleep in the afternoon. He doesn't know who he is. He wants to kill things, so he sings. It sounds slow nothing like tarmac bubbles popping in a heat wave. His grin takes a sticky hour. Cheering up, he chatters in the voice of a cultured fool to the dry papery wings and underbark underlings, to the marks he left here last year, to the mice and larks, voles and deer, to the quaint memory of himself as cyclically reliable as part of a country curriculum. He slips through one grim costume after another as he rustles and trickles and cusses his way between trees. He walks a few paces as an engineer in a day glow vest. He takes a step in a dinner suit and then an Anderson shelter, then a tracksuit. 
then a rusted jeep bonnet, then a leather skirt, but nothing works. He pauses as an exhaust pipe, then squirms into the shape of a rabbit snare, then a pissed on nettle into a pink strangled lamb. He plucks a blackbird from the sky and cracks open a yellow beak. He peers into the ripped face as if it were a clean pond. He flings the bird across the forest stage, stands up woodlot, bare, bushy, and stamps his spalted feet. His body is a suit of bark armour with the initials of long dead teenage lovers carved in the surface. He clomps through the wood, wide awake and hungry for his listening. Only one thing can cheer up crotchety toothwort, and that is his listening. He slides across the land at precisely the speed of dusk and arrives at his favourite spot. The village sits up pretty to greet him, sponged in half light. He climbs into the kissing gate. He is invisible and patient, about the size of a flea. He sits still. He listens. Just wonderful. Just him as that flea at the end of that piece. And of course, what, what I love is then that you take that even a step further. So that by the time you get to the end of part one, he's become, he's crumpled into, you describe him as a whiff for a suggestion. Absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Um, Thank you to Igor um, for translating that for our friends in Russia. <laughs> I know, absolutely brilliant, Igor. Um, so, Max, in terms of both of these texts then, um, you know, grief has been described as part novel, part polyphonic fable, part essay on grief. Lani has been described as a, a dramatic chorus. There's that wonderful theatrical um, staged um, part in, in, in the third section of the book. Um, it's been described as a fable and as collage. So when you have all of those various um, strands interconnecting within the text, how, how do you develop a book? How do you develop a book which is as hybrid as that? Um, what is the significance of um, these various genres and styles? And um, where is your starting point, I guess, I'm asking in terms of all of that? How do they evolve into these very hybrid forms? I think that the uh, intention has to not be hybridity for the sake of it. It has to be very keenly and with some discipline, I hope, tied to the intention of the book itself. So one technique is appropriate for one short story is utterly inappropriate for the next. Sure. The aim of Lanny was to create this questioning, this sort of machinery of question in the reader about who am I listening to and who is speaking? And what do I think about childhood innocence, myth, the environment, gossip, marriage, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a collaborative enterprise and the form had to encourage that collaboration. So for example, there is a point in part two when the names of the characters disappears. Mm -hmm. That isn't a gimmick, it's precisely to encourage that reader to think, ah, oh, can I recognize this, this person, this character, by the way they speak. And more than that, what is it I'm recognizing? Is it their vocabulary? Is it the syntax of, the, of their sentences or is it their politics? Am I recognizing this person's whatever, misogyny or, 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 or charm? Um, so I'm asking a reader to, to, to hear, to listen. And in order to do that, I have to give them a register in the book, which is pure overheard sound. So I'm teaching them as they read to listen to this sort of chorus voice. And that's only, appropriate to Lanny, that's what Lanny is about. I'm not going to do that in another book. <laughs> like the new book, Francis Bacon, is about the experience of paint and painted images on a person, the speed and relentlessness that happens in the human eye and brain when they're beholding a painting, if they have looked at other paintings and know a bit about art and the history of Europe and bodies and sex and pain, you know. So th th that technique would be horrendous in a book about <laughs> Monet. It would be utterly inappropriate, but it's the right approach for a book about Francis Bacon. So I guess that's my, my, my practice, is to think about the work in progress with its own rules. Other rules don't apply. The book announces its own rules and they have to be built very carefully and patiently. And then, they ha then you have to bring in all the other things like, how do I want this? to be, how do I want this to operate? What will this, if I set this thing, this living thing up and walking in the reader's mind, um, how much of it can I control? How much of it do I need to hand over? 
Um, how much do I want it to invoke other things, other written things or painted things or whatever it is. So I guess the thing is attention to attention to um, the, the the specifics of the project. Yeah, and and I mean, as you said, a fundamental part of that is voice. And that is absolutely true of, of grief and of Lani, though the voices work in very different ways. So if you go back to grief, you've got the typography of the cover, for example, and then you've got the intersection of the voices of the boys and dad and crow within the text. And then, of course, in Lani, you've got the playfulness of the, the community voices on the page and then how that changes in part two. Um, but what is very what is very obvious is the way in which is the rhythm of the language, the rhythm of the voices, the musicality of the voices. There's this gorgeous moment in Lani, for example, where you actually describe a moment like a cello note when Pete and his and Lani's mom and Lani are all together in in, in Pete's place. Um, so if we going back to grief for a moment, I was wondering whether you might give us a little taste of the boys' voices and of dad. Um, I think, and I think our musicality is right. I think I want musicality in prose, um, and that's why it, it, it should become almost poetry at times. Um, yeah. And I think that's partly just um, an impatience with the work, the workmanlike aspects of some prose writing yeah. um, which is obviously can be done masterfully and beautifully or it can be done with quite utilitarian utilitarian aims or whatever but I think that I, I, I get I guess I suppose I get from reading a lot of poetry desire to have musicality in the line yeah, um, yeah. You know, so I interrupted you so so shall I read yeah I think uh, for our um, audience our friends joining us from Russia we're on pages 19 and 20, so we have the boys and the guppy fish and dad's memory of, of mum. The intention with these, this hybridity, with this fragmentary thing is, with this book particularly, is not what you get with the boys and it's not what you get with the dad or the crow. Yeah. The three, as it were, the three panels of the triptych. It's what happens in between them, um, which I think has been my preoccupation. Is I talk about energy and expansiveness, but that's what it is. Is that there's a world of emotion between, you know, in a novel, like in in a great novel, even, you know, in in a in a in in the classic novels between the dinner party scene and the the character lonely in the fields, the, the, the movement is the thing. Um, yeah. Anyway, boys. My brother and I discovered a guppy fish in a rock pool somewhere. We set about trying to kill it. First, we flung shingle into the pool, but the fish was fast. Then we tried large rocks and boulders, but the fish would hide in the corners beneath small crevices or dart away. We were human boys and the fish was just a fish. So we devised a way to kill it. We filled the pool with stones, blocking and damming the guppy into a smaller and smaller area. Soon it circled slowly and sadly in the tiny prison pool and we selected a perfectly sized stone. My brother slammed it down over arm and it popped and splashed and rock on rock in water. And delightedly, we lifted it out and sure enough, the fish was dead. All the fun was sucked across the wide empty beach. I felt sick and my brother swore. He suggested flinging the lifeless guppy into the sea, but I couldn't bring myself to touch it. So we sprinted back across the beach and dad didn't look up from his book, but he said, You've done something bad, I can tell. Dad, we will never fight again. Our lovely, quick, template-ready arguments, our delicate cross-stitch of bickers. The house becomes a physical encyclopedia of no longer hers which shocks and shocks and is the principal difference between our house and a house where illness has worked away. Ill people in their last day on earth do not leave notes stuck to bottles of red wine saying, oh no, you don't, cock cheek. She was not busy dying and there is no detritus of care. She was simply busy living and then she was gone. She won't ever use makeup, turmeric, hairbrush, thesaurus. She will never finish. Patricia Highsmith novel, peanut butter, lip balm. 
and I will never shop for green Virago classics for her birthday. I will stop finding her hairs. I will stop hearing her breathing. Thank you, Max. I think so much we could talk about in relation to grief and Lanny, um, but I think this is a, is a poignant moment to move on to talk about your new book, The Death of Francis Bacon, which is in shops. Um, it's published by Faber, as David said, it came out just a week ago. And I've had the privilege of reading it a couple of times already. Um, I love on the back, it tells us very simply, Madrid, unfinished, man dying. It's the shortest of your three books, Max, it's 74 pages. Um, it, the book starts when Bacon is hospitalized um, in Madrid in 1992. So my, my, I guess my first question is why, why a book on Francis Bacon? I have unfinished uh, emotional business with Bacon, I, I had, as many people do, a uh, teenage obsession with Francis Bacon. He speaks to the ragey, cross, frustrated, disillusioned, um, scatologically enlightened uh, teenage brain. Um, and I have had sort of love affairs with many artists over the years. Um, you know, I love the work of Eva Hesse, the American sculptor. I love the work of Louise Bourgeois. I love the work of John Piper. I'm pretty, I'm pretty, um, <laughs> not picky. I love, I love <laughs> art. Um, but there are a few obsessions um, that really get their teeth stuck into you and you want to keep thinking about it. And you want to keep a bit like my relationship with the poems of Ted Hughes. I want to be analytical about what it is that was working on me then as a teenager. Um, and what it is it's working on me now 25 years later yeah do they retain their power what is their power in relation you know I ended up liking minimalism I ended up liking smooth calm um, British romantic modernism I, I why what was it about bacon so there was that but there was also as a writer the irresistible challenge of I wonder what would happen if I tried to create a prose surface uh, that was as sticky and um, suddenly blank and then fraught and energised as those paintings. Could I write well about that? Which would mean not writing art historical or biographical material. We've got that. That exists. Yeah. And something's missing in that for me. There's something, there's something lost in that translation. It might tell me a lot about the life, but it doesn't get to it. It doesn't, it doesn't speak to it of of the work so perhaps it's impossible but I thought I would try and I knew that it would alienate the reader I knew yeah. that it would for people that like a story with characters they can understand with a beginning and a middle and end it would be a, a very unpleasant reading experience but of course that would be the point of it in as much as when you go and stand in front and look at the bit bacon painting it's viscerally disturbing it's it's disturbing in ways you can't quite get your head around. It's also very alluring. There's also lots going on in them that you recognize or feel from elsewhere. You think, is that Velasquez? Has he copied Velasquez? Or mm -hmm. is that a nod to, to, to that looks more like a, a, like a, a, a habitat um, advert for a chair, or that looks like a fascist symbol, or that looks like a syringe, or that, you know, that looks like a pond, or that looks like a sofa. And, and the speed of your brain on art is why we all go and look at art. It's incredibly addictive and interesting thing to go and do. And, and the more you look, the more you get. So if you spend half an hour in front of a painting, your, your experience of it deepens and is enriched by letting your brain go to work on it and letting it go to work on you. And that's a completely universal and brilliant thing, but it's also highly specific yeah. to bacon. And so I thought, how can I make this thing stink of bacon? It has to be pretentious. It has to think itself very, very clever and then be desperately sad. It has to loathe itself. So, and it has to sort of step out of itself the whole time. And it's also about a person dying. So it has to be fractured because this is a sort of requiem. It's someone lying in there and their mental faculties are, are collapsing. So is that possible? I thought to myself, can I do that? Um, and then, <laughs> so this was a nice little project I set myself in, in <laughs> lockdown um, and, and it's, it's like, as Beckett said, fail and fail again. It's destined to fail, 
because it cannot be paint. I, I cannot write as Francis Bacon painted. The sheer impossibility of the thing is what makes it worth trying um, as a sort of outrageous analysis of what, what language is, where does it start working, where does it start failing. And I also didn't want it to be directly about Bacon in the same way as a Bacon portrait. If, I were to, if Bacon were to paint your face, it wouldn't look like you. He wasn't a realist, but it would have something of you. And that's what I wanted the book to have, is something of Bacon yeah, that absolutely. isn't available in, in, in neat visual analysis or, or you know, stories about him being drunk in Soho, something that is not there. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm just um, going to encourage our audience to, to send in their questions, which we will come to in just a minute or two. Um, so do please keep sending them in through the Q&A facility at the bottom of your screen. Um, but Max, I, I mean, I, I loved, I loved this, this book. I love, I love art. I very much, uh, I'm, you know, a big fan of Salvador Dali, as you know, and surrealism, and so on. Um, I love the fact that you describe this as an attempt to write as painting, um, not about it. And what really struck me about it is the way in which, within the sections of the book, so there are seven sections which are each is an oil on canvas with different dimensions and you've also got a preparatory sketch um, and so you've almost you almost set it up as this this framing device even in terms of how you open and close the sections so um, you op you open up um, inviting them to to take a seat and then you end up with this beautiful calming Spanish line intenta descansar so try and rest and that sort of shushing of his body and mind at the end but in the middle of all of that you've got this agitation and you know, you've got this multi-textured um, layered effect of voices and flashbacks and him trying to come to terms with his own paintings and his detractors and so on. Um, so I just wondered in, in that respect, I mean, I wondered about the actual framing device of it was not intentional to try and create um, a frame for each of these sections and then to allow Bacon to let rip as it were within each of those particular sections. The honest answer, um... <laughs> is that it was a concession to early responses to the book that it was just like a sort of blanket of confusion and pain with possible moments of enlightenment but it made it made early readers feel too uncomfortable and it made them just think oh, I don't know and I don't know nothing about bacon I'll just have to go and google all this stuff or read a load of books about bacon in order to get this and I thought, I mustn't, I don't want people to think they need to get it. I want them to let it work on them. And if they get it, fine. If they don't, better. So the framing device of the paintings allows, it, it, it sort of, it's a conceit that grounds the reader, but also slightly gives them handholds. And because they're not real paintings, it's also, it, get, it lets them in on the joke that yeah. we, are in the, we are in the world of, of, we are not in a figurative reality we are in an abstracted um traumatized because he is dying um but also hyper hugely hyperbolic fantasy it's a fantasia so the painting the made up paintings you know it announces it on page one it says preparatory sketch non-existent yeah <laughs> so you know we're in the world of of an artist game with himself a trick with himself in the same way as on the opening page of lanny the bit i read this guy is shape-shifting and ripping open a bird's mouth and he's turned into the shape of a condom we, we are not yeah. in a realist mode and i'm announcing that to the reader not to say oh look are we going somewhere on now just to say there's no there's no conceit uh, sorry there's no deceit there's yeah. just these are these are literary patternings and methods that i want to share with you in order to try and get deeper into the subject and i i'm absolutely aware i mean i've i've, I've seen i've seen some responses to this book which which really don't like that precise thing. They think it, it bothers them. They want to know what, what Bacon paintings I'm talking about. They feel yeah. they don't know enough about Bacon to enjoy it. Therefore, it's an exclusionary thing. Therefore, it's trying to be clever in a way that is not nice to them. And, I, and I'm sorry for that response, but it is also in a way appropriate to the subject matter, to Bacon, um, who, who who used his cleverness and, and repeated himself because he was frightened and 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 uh, and trying to endlessly trying to prove himself to his rivals and his critics 
um, but also that they that, but also wanted to be loved. So this is a sort of vulnerability at the heart of all his flamboyance. And if and if the, the reader response is is getting that, then I can only be I can only be pleased. Yeah. Um, because the, the the worst thing would be if it was bland, um, or or utterly explicable. Oh yes, I know that. I can find that on Wikipedia. That ticks that box. So right. yes, we know he died in tick. Yes, we know he was friends with Lucian Freud tick. Yes, we know that look, none of that um, has a place in an experiment like this. And that's why it has to be short. It's what I was talking about when I was talking about the bespoke specific requirements of each book. Yeah. You, can't, you can't go on it for 15, 20,000 words with this type of thing. It has to be short. Um, and you run the risk that someone will throw it across the room. And that's absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know you are writing about bacon so we've got to we got to expect agitation and fracturing and all of those things you know all of yeah. that sort of dirty stuff in the mix don't we um we have so many questions coming through for you max um which is fantastic thank you all so much for sending these through um we'll try and get through as many of them as we can if that's okay so yeah. um one of the questions we have is do you wait for inspiration or do you write on a regular daily basis? So about your writing practice, essentially. I I hope both. Um, I keep a notebook um, near me at all times. Um, my current notebook is yellow for my new novel. Um, I also keep one by my bed. I write on bus tickets in my phone. I send myself text messages. I send myself emails. <laughs> I pull over the car to write something. Um, I, I, want an ex I want busyness all the time, but I've also learned not to force it. Um, it isn't writing is not building a wall. Um, you sometimes have to sit back and live your life. Um, I'm fond of Seamus Heaney's. I think we discussed this before, Elaine. Yeah. Seamus Heaney's formulation, which is about going to the word hoard. You live your life. You gather things. You find things. You are outraged, appalled, broken-hearted horny excited bought anything you, yeah. living the human life letting your consciousness be battered around by the forces uh, that exert upon it and then you take that material back so you're gathering stuff to make your attack on the uh, uh, on the indistinct even even sharper um, yeah. so I, I i try and write something every day even if it's just a even if it's a, a doodle or a drawing that will become something later yeah, and it is about being open to that, isn't it? Just allowing the ideas to come and being receptive to them wherever you are, whatever you're doing, even if you're cooking the dinner or putting the boys to bed or whatever it happens to be. Receptiveness, yeah. And, and, and also accept that you might have your very best idea while you are cooking the dinner or trying to happy. We're only human beings. And also I'm a very domestic person. I do all the cooking and I like to do all the cooking. I like to be with my family. They're only just the other side of this door. You know, I, I'm not sitting in a, in a gold chair in a writer's retreat somewhere with my laptop. I don't even have a laptop. I've got to be here. My responsibility right. is to these people. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have a question here for you, Max, from Owen Shears, who um, says that as he read Lanny, he said, uh, I could hear a subterranean murmur of David Jones's in parenthesis, something in the immediacy of the moment. Um, the voice braided with that sense of deep time. Has Jones's work been an influence or a guiding light for you? What a beautiful question, Owen. Uh, David Jones is probably my favourite writer. It, it's a preposterous idea to have a favourite, um, but he is the writer to whom I return most often, in parenthesis, especially. I think it's a holy book, an extraordinary miracle of a book, which unfolds and reveals itself to me wildly differently every time I read it, but also his art uh, and, his, and his half books, as it were. Um, has he been an influence on me? I think he's possibly an influence on the Bacon book in as much as he, I was preoccupied with the surface detail in Anathemata and, and, and ways of um, uh, a sort of intensity of illusion, uh, the sort of spell of those books on, on the, the textual element of them being very rich with meaning in a way that you might feel you need a dictionary. And then, you know, Jones was, you know, there are glossaries, you know, there, there is a whole book published which explains you know, almost every word of both of both the major Jones books, but you can read them without. And I thought as well, that space between knowing and not knowing is so important and so revelatory. And also to me is connected to the sacred. 
um, that in the not knowing and in, in, in the anxiety one feels in the sort of meditative moment of realizing what one does and doesn't know and the work one does to understand things feels very much like looking at a picture you know reading David Jones is like studying fine art or or medicine so yes is, is the answer a hundred percent yes always <laughs> and, and onwards and I'd love to, you know I, I love to talk David Jones and I and I hope one day Owen and I will have that conversation lovely thank you really interesting question here for you um one which we touched on actually this week when we were working um and liaison with Igor on the translation we didn't even get to talk about translation today um, in great detail. Um, but there's a question here about um, the difference between the crow and the raven. Um, as, as we've been discussing this week, in the Russian translation of Greek, the crow becomes a raven. So um, what we were talking about in terms of male and female forms of the nine in Russian. So do you make any difference between the crow and the raven? You, one must, one must, I fear, yeah, different species, um, very different literary uh, background as well. Um, they're both superstars, um, but no, Ra you know, Raven has his own uh, specific literary pedigree, um, and it's important because it's a book about homage. It, it, the, the father's obsession is Hughes's crow, um, and Hughes's crow was very specifically a crow, not a raven, um, in relation to the trickster tradition um, from various different storytelling and symbolic um, iconographic traditions around the world. So yeah, I'm happy if translation has to slip um, and has to do the closest thing. Uh, I mean, being again, being translated is so extraordinary, you know, the title can't be exact. There's no such thing. It's a preposterous notion to think it could be exact. So I guess one has to accept these slippages. And then if, if there's a little slip between species, <laughs> in, in order to not have a confusing, I think in Russian it would be female bird, which given the complexity of the story as regard a missing matriarch and stuff would be too confusing and misleading. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy that he's a raven in this, in this one instance. <laughs> I allow it. You allow it just this once. <laughs> um, question for you about your characterization. Um, so, um, from Natalie Holbrook, do your characters appear in your head fully developed or do you find yourself grappling with them for a while before they, before they find their voice? Um, a little bit of both. Um, different folks, different strokes as, as it were, like um, I, I needed to work very hard on the dad in Lanny um, because of the type of man I wanted him to be. Uh, he's not based on anyone, but I, I, I built him up in my head and spent a lot of time with him thinking about his um, sort of socioeconomic tics and habits and how he would behave right down to how he dresses and the kind of like I'm weirdly obsessed with what kind of clothes he likes to wear and how he, the feeling of fabric on his skin and stuff. None of that, none of that exists in the book. Um, so there's a degree of sort of godlike control there, but there's also the very opposite, absolute letting go. And these characters speaking back to you um, and finding that they have a different voice than the one you'd expecting them to have and, and, and teaching oneself to hear that um, yeah. and allow that um, and I think that can happen across the narrative arc of a book or I think it can happen in a line so I think it, it, it you know the way that you know for you know it can happen in word choice um, in a poem and be trans utterly transformative so I think that both that um, trying to find that duality between control and and loss of control when you're thinking about character is important. Yeah, um, I'm very conscious of time and I know we're just going over. So I think if we take one more question, Max, would you be happy to do that? Of course, yeah. Um, let me just see. I'm sorry we yeah. can't answer them all. Uh, there's a there's a, a slightly more political one I noticed up in the box about um, is there a problem with access? Um, it, sorry to sorry to give you a single word answer that 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 um, attendee, but yes, <laughs> yes, there is. Yeah, um, I'm looking also at questions coming in from our Russian audience too. We've got a question here about um, influences on your work. What Russian authors have influenced your works, and do you have any favourite Russian artists? Oh, a nice question. Um, well, the, the book I mentioned, the the, the translated. Um, three or four hundred page volume of Russian fairy tales was a really profoundly inspirational book to me um, and I loved I went through a Viktor Pelevin uh, stage um, I think my favorite Russian 
I think uh, Babel, Isaac Babel, um, and the Red Cavalry stories w w was a book that, that really blew my mind, actually, the, 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 where, where the sort of reportage and the, and the political writing meets the pure brilliance of the short story form. I don't think I've, I don't think I've ever, I mean, I remember getting up on the airplane and going to find my wife, who was sitting separate from me and saying, I've just read a book that changed my life, Red Cavalry. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I, I think I had epiphanies reading Chekhov, um, Bunin, um, yeah. Anna Akhmatova. I, I went through a big um, Anna Akhmatova fan um, stage. I just, you know, the the, the poetry of, of resistance. Um, so yeah, I, I suppose I suppose. I mean, uh, Russian poets um, continue to influence me. Uh, I don't read many contemporary Russian poets, and I'm sorry for that. There is a very good anthology of of, of Russian poetry translated by Robert Chandler, which has some contemporary or recent poets in it. And I don't know their work as well as as the 20th century poets, and I hope to rectify that. Um, but I guess, it, yeah, I guess if I had to choose one, Isaac. Yeah, it's really tough, isn't it? There's just such a wonderful array of material to choose from. Yeah. I think I think we're going to have to wrap up, Max. Though I I could spend all afternoon talking to you, as as I'm sure our audience could. I mean, the the questions are coming in thick and fast, and we're really sorry we couldn't get to answer all of them. Um, but I'd, no, I'd just like to say that. I'm really grateful for people asking questions and, and yeah, sorry not to be able to, to answer more. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Max. Um, we will post a, a little um, survey form into the chat today. Um, we'd really be grateful for your feedback. If you do have um, if you do have a few minutes to fill that in, that would be absolutely brilliant. Um, obviously, this is um, this is the first in a series in the collaboration. Um, that we're running between Swansea University and um, the Gorky Institute in Moscow. Um, and we've got a, a whole series of events coming up um, for our students in Swansea and in Moscow. But our next keynote event, which is open to, um, to everybody, is on Tuesday the 26th of January. Um, it's 4 p.m. GMT, so the same time as today. And it's a panel discussion on crime, fiction and legal truth, which sounds absolutely fascinating. And there will be a link about that in the chat as well. So I've got lots of thanks to give. Um, first of all, Max, absolutely brilliant and fascinating discussion. And we are thrilled that we, you were able to open our series today. It's just wonderful to talk to you. Um, and always, always a pleasure and a joy. Um, congratulations again on, on Francis Bacon. And we look forward to seeing all the brilliant stuff that you're going to be doing over the coming months. Um, and we'll keep talking about literature and literacy as we always do. Um, so huge, huge thank you from all of us. Um, thank you obviously to our audience, to all of you for joining us today. It's been wonderful um, to have you joining us both from the UK and Russia. We're very grateful for that. Um, a big thank you to all of our collaborators, sponsors and friends. So the Maxim Gorky Institute of Literature and Creative Writing in Moscow, the Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, the British Council, the Cultural and Education section of the British Embassy in Moscow. Special thanks to Lydia Kassed and to our translator, Igor Mokin, for facilitating everything today. And thanks also to Professor David Britton, Matthew Hughes and Christina Magro at Swansea University. So our final thanks again to Max. On behalf of everybody, can I just say what a joy it's been. Thank you so much and best of luck with everything. And take care, everybody, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.